It's such a joy to be here this, after, this, this afternoon with you, and it's, it's hard to walk and watch your intro video at the same time, because I wanted to see what they'd say about me. But I'm really glad to be here. I'm here with my wife, uh, Carol. Uh, we've been married 23 years, and it's such a joy for me to be here with her. Uh, we serve in Nairobi, Kenya, a church called Mavuno Church, and uh, we have three teenagers in our house, which keeps us humble and uh, praying, and so we're really glad to be here and to have some time together away from them uh, to be with you all f- uh, for, this, uh, for this time. It's been a joy being here. We've enjoyed uh, being inside this family, almost like visitors into a family, and one of the things I said about this conference is it really feels like being with people who like each other which is a good thing when you're with Christians, isn't it? Uh, to be with people who actually like each other. And uh, I am excited to be bringing God's word uh, this, this afternoon. And I just want to begin with a question. Can you think of a significant moment that completely changed the trajectory of your life? I mean, you woke, up, you woke up one day, and you went into the day, it was a normal day, you're just minding your own business, doing the things you normally do, and then wham, bam, something out of the blues and your life has never been the same. Ever had a day like that? I want to share a story about a time when that happened to me. And it was late in December 1995, and my wife Caro and I, very, very newly wed couple, uh, we're on the beach uh, in Kenya, uh, having a great vacation with some friends, and we're having a conversation, and uh, I'm sitting next to one of my friends who's a cool, calm, collected, not very excitable kind of person. Never shows emotion, always is very, he weighs things from a distance. And we're having this conversation with my friend, and I asked him a question, because he just transitioned from a job that I thought was a very prestigious job with a big oil firm. Uh, He was an engineer in that firm. He was making tons of money. And then he had taken this risky move to go into this startup, uh, into a field that nobody knew anything about. Uh, it was IT, so that, that kind of dates the story. Uh, information technology, computers, and all that stuff. And I remember asking Tim, why would you leave such a lucrative position? Why would you leave such a secure job, such a, a job that people would die for, and go into a field that nobody's ever heard anything about? And at that moment, Tim, he, t- Tim just, he leant forward. And he began to speak with more animation than I'd ever seen in his life. I, could, I already knew something was different, but I, now I could see the fire was on in his eyes. And he began to speak faster than I'd ever seen him speak. And he was speaking with energy. And he start, started to describe to me what IT was and what this computer thing that was coming into the world that was going to change the whole world. And how he, as a believer, felt that this was a place that God wanted to position him so that he can have an impact for the kingdom in this field that was going to change the next generation. And then I'll never forget what he said next. He said to me, everything I've ever wanted in my life, everything I've ever been trained for, all the challenges I've ever faced, every experience I've ever had, God was weaving those things together to prepare me for this moment. I don't remember a single word that my friend said after that. It's like he had reached across the table and he had slapped me with those words. And I remember just being intensely jealous at that point and just thinking, oh my goodness, I'm the one who's in ministry. I'm the one who's serving in church. I've never felt such an intense clarity about what God was calling me to. And you know, those words that Tim had said had ignited a hunger within me. Uh, Somehow at that point, I began to realize that none of us was created to just do a job. None of us was created to just, to just live and exist. That every one of us was created to live a life of significance and to do something that would change much bigger than we thought. And at that point, I began to pray. From that point on, I began to say, God, I want you to give, a, give me a vision, something to live for. Show me the purpose you created me for. Give me a purpose that is big enough for me to not only live for, but also to die for. And I began to wrestle with God every day, saying, God, show me, show me the purpose that you created me for. You know, it's very interesting that inside every one of us, there's a hunger for more. We know it. There's a hunger for more. There's a hunger for our lives to count for something bigger than our lives and than ourselves. And it's interesting that when Jesus called his disciples, he tapped into that hunger this hunger that he himself had put into their lives. This is what he tapped into. And when I read the story 
of how he approached his disciples. I see him tapping into the hunger that was already inside them. There's a great scripture. There are many great scriptures when he calls his disciples, but there's one particularly that I want to look at this afternoon. And it's Mark chapter 1, verse 14 to 20. It tells us about one of those encounters that Jesus had with his disciples as they were minding their own business. And this is what it says, Mark chapter 1, verse 14 to 20. It says, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once, they left their nets and they followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men, and they followed him. Do you mind if we just pray for a minute as we dive into God's word? Father, thank you. Thank you for the privilege that we mortal beings, that we can come and listen to immortal words. We can listen to words that were spoken by our own creator, words that were spoken for us, even though it was years ago that these words were intended for us this afternoon. And Father, I pray that you would take these words, they're just words on a page, but you would take these words and you turn them into the living word that would bring transformation to every single one of us. Lord, I invite you to come into this place. I know that we come from different places and we have different thoughts running through our minds. Some of us are thinking about the weekend and the things we, we are running back into. But I pray, Lord, that for this moment right now, that any destruction that would keep your children from accessing and hearing your word, that, Father, right now we submit it to your feet in Jesus' name. And we declare that any power against you is bound right now. And every single person here would hear exactly what you want them to hear. And, Father, I surrender myself to you as well. And I pray that this word would be pleasing to you and that you will use it to bring transformation to your children. We love you, Jesus. For we pray this in Jesus' name and God's people say it. Amen. Amen. Well, you know, Jesus did not come to this world to start a church. He didn't come into this world to start a movement of churches. He didn't even come into the world to start a great world religion. Jesus came for nothing short of starting a revolution that would change the world and advance God's kingdom. It's very interesting that when you hear Jesus, when you listen to his message, you know, we, 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 we are preachers and we preach about Jesus' words and there are many sermons about being born again. And I always say it's very interesting, striking to me that in the scripture, Jesus speaks about being born again once. Book of John. To this man called Nicodemus. But if you read every sermon of Jesus, what did he preach about? The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. What is this kingdom? What is kingdom? You know, the kingdom of God simply meant the rule of God. The authority of God coming on earth. This is why Jesus was killed, by the way. Because this was a treasonable message. He was basically saying that He's here to speak about a new power that is here to take over. And all the people who, who knew that there was already a power in control, I mean, they, they were scared when they had those words. Uh, because he was talking about the fact that God's, God is here to take authority over the things that he already created. Now, it's interesting because many of his listeners thought he was talking about a political revolution. I mean, they were tired of the colonizing influence of the Romans. And they thought, maybe this is the one who's come to free us from the yoke of oppression. Some of his other speakers, they thought he was speaking about a spiritual, uh, 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 spiritual freedom, that he's the one who was coming, they, they were tired because of the secularizing influence of the Romans and the Greek culture. And they thought, this is the one taking us back to the pure spiritual religion of the time of Moses. But it's interesting that Jesus had a very different revolution in mind. His revolution would have political implications. And it would change the whole empire of Rome. 
in time. His revolution would have spiritual implications and it would change what was going on in the spiritual atmosphere as well. But it was much bigger than just politics or spirituality. Jesus' mission was nothing short of restoring the rightful rule of his father in every sphere and every aspect of society. And that's the context with which he walks to these young men. I mean, they're, they're, they're fishermen. The Bible tells us, not incidentally, it's important, because they're doing what fishermen do. They're earning a living. They're catching fish. And Jesus walks along. He's preaching about the kingdom of God. And he walks along, and he sees these young men minding their own business, practicing their trade, catching fish. And he walks up to them, and he gives them a clarion call that would change their lives forever. And it's a clarion call that is still changing lives today, thousands of years later. Now, it's interesting to note what Jesus did not say. Jesus didn't say to them, come follow me and I'll make you a great Christian. He didn't say that. He didn't say, come and follow me and I'll make you an amazing church member. He didn't say that either. He didn't say, come and follow me and I'll give you a really good Christian life. He didn't say that either. He said, come and follow me and I will send you out to fish for people. One old version says, and I'll make you fishers of men. Now, this is more than just a cute children's song. Uh, Jesus had an agenda. He used those words very carefully. He knew what they did. They were fishermen. And like most people in our congregation, they were doing what they needed to do to feed their families. They were hustling to make a living. They were working hard. And if you ask them why they were doing it or what they planned to do, I suspect like if there were people, like the people in my congregation, they'd have had a plan. And they'd have told you, you know, we're here because if we work hard enough doing this, we'll be able to own our own boat. And you ask them, why do you want to do that? Or what do you want to do with that? And they say, with that, then we have the resource and we can make more money and we can have a fleet of boats. And then they'll say, and, and, and when that happens, then we can form a partnership with the Zebedee brothers in the cove over there. And we can control fishing on this side of the lake. And maybe after that, we can have a fish processing plant. And we can sell dried fish across the whole region. And then we'll be set for life. The people in my congregation will probably say that. Now, the interesting thing about Jesus, and I love this about him, he didn't trash their ambitions. He didn't tell them, that's, that's rubbish. Why are you talking about this? this he, didn't, he didn't do that. He didn't demean the things that they were focused on. It's like he said, catching fish, that's not a bad thing. But let me show you what I made you to catch. Let me show you what I really made you to catch. And he says, you're not going to just catch fish. You're going to catch much more than that. Because you see, this fish thing that you have, I put it in you. That desire to catch things, I'm the one who created in you. And now let me show you what I created you to catch. And it's like he's saying, give me your profession. Give me your ambitions. Give me those aspirations you have. And let me show you why I gave them to you. There's a reason why I created you like this. I'm going to make your life so attractive that you not be known in history as the greatest fish catchers of fish that ever lived. But you will be known as people who caught men and women for the sake of the kingdom of God. And years today, eight later, we have children named after those men because they are men who changed the world in their generation. They understood why they had been created. You know, it's very interesting that after three years of training, Jesus says to these men, I've taught you enough. And he says, now go. And make disciples of all nations. And it's like he's saying to them, the revolution that has begun in your life, now take it into the world. The thing that you've discovered, now share it with other people. Continue this revolution of the kingdom that is going to change the whole world and turn it upside down for the sake of my father. So let me ask you a question. What is the big kingdom dream that you are calling your people to? What's that big kingdom dream that you are calling your people to? You know, I believe one of the greatest tragedies in the world today 
is that the church seems to have forgotten its calling. We seem to have forgotten our master's calling. We call people to join our churches so that their lives can become better. We don't say it that way, but that's what we're calling them to. We call them into our churches so they can become better Christians and they can live better lives. And when you walk into our bookstores, that's what, what's there. We sell books on how to be a nice parent and a great married person. And, and, and none of those things is bad. All those things are good things. But you know, sometimes I think it's possible for us to lose sight of why we are calling these people. That like, it's so easy for us to settle into calling people to live a good life when God called them to live a dangerous life, a life that will bring chaos to the kingdom of darkness in their generation. And this is what God is calling every Christian to. And I believe it's a huge part, this, this, this losing this focus. It's a, a big part of what turns off people in my culture from the gospel. Because they look into the church and they see people and they see that these people have the same small aspirations as they do as well. They're living for the same small things. It's just that they've spiritualized those things. But it's the same things. And there's no difference. It's just that yours is spiritual and mine is secular, but we're living for the same small dreams. And it turns people away from the church because they don't see any difference. And so I want to ask you that question again. What is the big kingdom dream that you are calling your people to? My conversation with my friend Tim that day, oh my goodness, it, it started up a season of holy discontent in my life. And I could no longer live for the small dreams that I was living for. And I began to pray, God, show me why you created me. Give me this reason to live. Give me this thing that is so big that I not only just be willing to live for it, I will be willing to give my life for it at a minute's notice. I wanted to live for this thing. And that, that, that thing that Tim said, it set me off on a journey. And I wrestled with God. I said, God, I will not let you go until you bless me, until you show me why you made me. And it set me off on a journey. And that journey culminated with me 10 years later, helping with a team, helped by a team to start Mavuno Church. And Mavuno, it's a Swahili word that means harvest. And right from the beginning, we were committed that we didn't just want to start a nice church to create nice Christians. But we wanted to start a church that would be so revolutionary and so useful to the community it was in that if the government or the city ever tried to shut us down, that the people in the slums next to the church, that the Muslims in our neighborhood, that they would protest and they would pick it around our church and they would say, you can't shut those people down. They are useful to us. And this was our determination. And this is what we set out to do. And the mission statement that God gave us at that time is turning ordinary people into fearless influencers of society. So this is what I think God wants every one of us to be. You know, we have ordinary dreams. We want to live a safe life. We want to live a nice life. And sometimes the church seems to almost affirm that dream and say, you know, God just wants you to live such a nice, safe life. But that's not what God wants for you. Those are small dreams. God wants you to be a fearless influence of society. And this is what we set out to do. And you know, it's very interesting that having set out on this journey, it's completely changed us. It's completely changed how we do church. It completely changed the way we set out to disciple people. It completely changed everything we set out to do. And 12 years later, God has been so faithful. Uh, we've seen lives changed across our city as we set out to call people to big dreams. As we set out to ask every person in our church, hey, what is, what is, what is the purpose God made you for? And as we began to realize that our job as the priests, as our job as the pastors, was not to be the ones up front doing the ministry. It was to release the congregation of God so that they could go out into the, the world and change the world in their generation. And so we call people out and we say, what is God calling you to? And whenever we disciple, in all our discipleship process, this is a question we're asking. What is your purpose? What is the big thing that God created you for? And it's very interesting that 12 years later, God has spread us as a movement. We're so grateful to God that right now we exist in 10 different countries. And the churches 
in every one of those countries is people who are discovering their purpose and who are going out to change the world. Our vision, by the way, is to start a culture-defining church in every capital city of Africa and the gateway cities of the world by 2035. And we know that we cannot, we cannot live such a big vision or such a big dream unless God himself does it. Amen? Amen. If you have a dream right now that doesn't make you sweat, <laughs> it's not from God. Yeah? yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you have a dream that doesn't wake you up at night thinking, that dream is not from God. In fact, I want to say, if you don't have a dream where you think, even God must be sweating at this one, maybe it's not a God dream. And we, we sleep, I, I, I lose sleep over this dream. It's like, God, how will you do it? And my goodness, it's, it's been a journey of faith and adventure. Just seeing God, we, we, one of our church plants is in Berlin, Germany. And I think that's been the most exciting adventure, one of the most exciting adventures for me to see a church in Africa, planting a church in a wealthy suburb of a, of a city that has 2% Christians, one of the hardest places uh, in Germany to start a church. And I was asking God for easier places to start. And, and God sent us to Berlin. And the church had about maybe 10 people when we, when, when we, when we connected with them. And they asked us, would you come and take us over? And so we, by God's grace, we went into Berlin. And we had a young German couple that was part of our congregation that we had discipled for three years. And we sent them back and we said, would you lead that church? And, I mean, they went, they were young, young, they grew up in atheist, East Germany, uh, no Christian background in their, in, 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 and, and God had just helped them really blossom and grow. And they went back among their own people, and they began to, to disciple people and lead people into their purpose. And today, by God's grace, uh, that church that was dying is a church of a hundred and something people, uh, young people. The church has renewed in age as well. Uh, all German speaking. I mean, that's always fun for me to visit and they have to translate what they're saying. Uh, but it's fun to just see what God is doing. And I say, to God be the glory. Amen. To God be the glory. You see, when you have a kingdom dream and, the re and, and it happens, you can never take glory to yourself. Because you say, only God could have done that. Only God could have allowed a church in Africa to plant a church in Berlin. A hundred years ago, the Germans sent missionaries. That's why we're here. That's why I'm a Christian. It's because they send missionaries to my country. But it's a joy that a hundred years later, we can send missionaries to their own country. Only God could do that. Only God. So what's the big kingdom dream that you're calling the people in your congregation to? I'm going to tell you a few stories because I'm an African preacher. <laughs> Africans like to tell stories. I don't know if you know this. Is that okay if I tell stories? Okay. All right. Good. Awesome. So, so I'll tell you a few stories about people in our church who have discovered the big kingdom dream that God created them for. And I'll start with the story of Anne. Anne was um, just a beautiful young lady, um, young designer. Her family ran an export company. First time I heard about Anne was from her sister, who God had brought to our church, uh, was an amazing Christian, loved God, and was praying for her sister. Uh, she was desperately praying that her sister would come to know, to know Christ. We have a program in our church we call Mizizi, and, uh, and here in this country it's called Rooted. And so she did Rooted, and she, was, she, she began to pray uh, for a group that she would influence, and her sister was one of them. And I remember her sharing and saying, pray for my sister. And one day we had a big service, and she invited her sister to come, and Anne came. And we're all so excited that Anne showed up, and Anne actually gave her life to Jesus when she came to church. Uh, but not only did she do that, she joined Mizizi, this 10-week experience. Uh, she signed up for it the first day she came to our church. And in the process, God just began to stir up this question in her. What is that big thing that God created you for? Now, Anne was a designer. Her family had an export uh, business. And so those are the things she knew. But she began to ask God, show me why you made me God. Show me why you gave me these things that I have in my hands. And around that time, in 2008, our country had a, 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 a traumatic experience, post-election violence. And our country was very divided. And there was violence in our country. And people were displaced, quite a few people were displaced from their homes. And Anne, at that point, began to think, maybe this is what God made me for. Maybe I have something to offer into this mess. And so she put a group together, a small group of people together who had been displaced from their homes, had lost their income. And she began to train them how to do jewelry because she's a great artist. And she makes great, great, great earrings and, 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 and jewelry. She began to put these groups together so they could do that. 
And they, they, they made some jewelry, and she was able to use some of our connections to start, export, to start selling the jewelry. And she made some money and gave it to them. And slowly, she, a, a kingdom idea began to shape in her heart. And out of this, God gave birth to an organization that today we call Bawa Hope. And Bawa, just is, Bawa is a dove. The, the, the sign of it is a dove, a flying dove, which is peace and hope. And she brings peace and hope into communities. And what Anne today has done is taken different groups of very disenfranchised, the poorest of the poor, and she's put them into groups of men and women. And she's allowed them to, she's taught them how to create this amazing jewelry. And because of God's favor upon her business, she's been able to export it across the whole world. She goes into trade fairs across the world and sells their jewelry and then remits the money back to them. Because of Anne, this one young girl, cynical person, living a completely complacent life, understanding her purpose. Today, there are families across our nation who've been completely pulled out of poverty. I mean, it's, it's amazing to watch their stories. I mean, you walk around and you see Anne, and she's on fire. She loves what she does. Can I tell you another story? I'll tell you, this is another favorite one of mine, and uh, I don't have pictures to support this one, but I just thought about it, so I'll tell you. Uh, and this is Daisy. Daisy is um, a housewife, a uh, homemaker, pretty comfortable life, uh, didn't have to work, her husband had a good job. And so what Daisy did is she came into the church and did this Mizizi experience. Again, God just began to speak to her heart. She'd been a Christian for a long time, but never really asked what her purpose was. So she began to ask God, why did you create me? What's the big kingdom dream you made me for? And on the same day, three people asked her for a loan. Three different people uh, that worked for her husband. One of the people was uh, the, her, her husband's driver. The other person was the, the gate man, the person at the, uh, who guarded the, the apartment complex where they lived. And the third person was, I think, the person who cleaned their, their apartment. And they both, all of them told, them the, told her the same story. We're out, I'm out of money. Uh, I'm not able to borrow money to tide me over to the end of the month. Could you give me a little loan to help me go to the end of the month? And as Daisy was going to do the easy thing, which is just to give them a handout, Something in her heart rung, and she said, maybe this is what God made me for. And Daisy called, uh, asked the three of them, said, if you will come next week to my house. She gave them something, but said, next week, if you come to my house and bring a friend, and I'll help you put together a little group where you can start to save well. And I'll teach you some of the things I've learned about managing money. And hopefully what will happen is if we can save enough money, I'll double it. I'll put in some of my own seed money, and we can help you start businesses. And the next week, she's expecting six people to show up in her living room, 15 come. <laughs> and so Daisy, Daisy is just in shock, and she's calling a friend from her life group in church, uh, please come and help us. And so the friend comes, and they, they, they make enough snacks for everybody. And then she says to them, if you could just start saving, and they start to save. And as she's praying how to help them, God gives her a divine idea. And she figures out, instead of giving them, uh, instead of giving them money and expecting them to start a business, what if... I, give, I, I do some research in the areas they live in and find three or four businesses that are doing well. And then I'll do a business plan for each of those. I mean, God just was leading her in this. Uh, she did a business plan for each of those. And then instead of lending them money, she gave them products. She lent them products. And they went and sold those products using her little business plan. And they were able to sell everything out and came back and got more product. And soon there were businesses flourishing in her group. Her group did so well, they invited their friends. And another group formed. And fast forward to today, and it's just been a miracle. Uh, one of the volunteers in her group, uh, in, in, in one of the church volunteers who joined her, her little initiative, uh, was a young politician's wife. And a few years ago, that politician was elected as our deputy president for our country. And he was so intrigued by what was going on and had seen such incredible life change through this ministry. They made that their big thing, he and his wife. And today, because of their influence and through their help, Daisy's organization has given loans to over 100,000 families in our nation. I mean, this is one housewife, one, one homemaker, who's probably thinking that this is all. She's just looking after her children. She's thinking this is a big kingdom dream. And God shows her, I made you for more. And today she's changed. I mean, there are people, we meet people whenever we walk into our ministry who were selling their bodies because they were so desperate to make money. They were selling their bodies in prostitution. And today, they not only own homes, they provide employment for others. I mean, this is living for a kingdom dream. I mean, I could tell you stories about people like, like Richard, a hip-hop artist, uh, whose biggest dream was to win a Grammy Award, and who was just living a selfish life. 
began to discover his kingdom purpose and started an organization called Clean the Airwaves. And through his influence, it's changed the airwaves in our country. I mean, they've been able to influence. He, he got a group of, of producers together and they began to, to have a dream of what would it look like to change our culture's downward trajectory in the media that is destroying family values. And just because of that, those conversations, they were able to clean the airwaves. And today, if you come to our country, I mean, it's one of those really radical things that nobody know, knows how it began, began except those of us who are in this, on the inside. Uh, we have, like, if you turn on your TV on a Sunday, there's Christian programming in all the main uh, TV stations. And I can tell you, 10 years ago, it was, it was just skimpily dressed people and just all the rubbish you'd expect from the media. But just one hip-hop artist asking the question, what did God make me for? I mean, I could tell you about Ken, who was a young aspiring film producer who was doing really well. And when he began to ask that question, God led him to start a film school in the slums. And today what he's doing is teaching young, mostly Muslim children how to make films about their life. And as he began to do that, these young people began to get incredible jobs and began to provide for their families. And today a whole community has been changed of young Muslims who've been changed. And many of them have started to follow Jesus. And they don't see it as conversion. They just say, I want the Jesus that Ken has. I mean, this, this is what it is. And I want to tell you this, that if you ask any of these people and many others why they do what they do, you know what's going to happen? They're going to sit up and a fire is going to come on in their eyes. And they're going to start telling you how this is the thing that they were created for. And you know, it's so amazing that they don't have to get into evangelism mode like we Christians sometimes do. That just as they tell you their story, you will be compelled and you're going to start asking questions about where do you go to church again? Because I want what you have. What's that kingdom dream that you are calling the people in your congregation to? If there's one thing I'd like us, and I'd like to encourage you as my fellow ministers, brothers and sisters, is that you will not make the mistake of calling your people to live and to give their lives for small human dreams. Please don't make the mistake of calling the people that you lead to live lives, small lives, that are not the lives that God died for. Call your people to live big lives, to live adventurous lives of faith, to live lives of sacrifice, to live for something that is worth not just living for, but also dying for. And this is what I sense that the Lord wanted me to speak about this afternoon. And I want to pray for us. Is that okay if I pray? I guess this is a Christian conference, so it should be okay. <laughs> I'd like to pray for us. And I really sense as I share God's word this afternoon that there are some people here who has, you've heard God's word, but there's a conviction in your heart. And you recognize that I've been living for a small dream. I've been living for, I may even be in ministry, but I'm living for a small dream. Maybe I've even been in ministry for many years. But when I assess my life and as I listen to God right now, I recognize that this is not the God dream that God created me for. I want to speak to somebody here. You know, it's amazing. You might even be 80 years old and you realize right now that I'm living for a small dream. I love, I love the Bible story of Caleb who at 80 years old says, give me the mountain. They're living for a God-sized dream. And maybe God is saying, I made you for mountains, and you're living for mole hills. And I sense that there's somebody here, God is saying, I want to speak to you right now. I want you to commit yourself to me. I want you to wrestle with me like Jacob did. I want you to ask me to give you your new name and to show you the reason I created you. And so I'm going to be praying for you in a second. The second group I want to pray for is I sense that there's some ministers here that God has spoken to, and you're convicted because you've been calling your people to a small dream. You've been raising people to be safe Christians and not the radical kingdom changers, kingdom shapers that God called them to. And I want to pray for you, my fellow brothers and sisters who are in that position. So I'm going to do a very African thing here. I don't know if it's something that you do in your church. Maybe you've never done this. But I'm going to ask you if God is speaking to you, that you would stand up. 
If it is you that God is speaking to and you want to say, God, I want to wrestle with you. I'm going to hold on to you until you show me that dream. Forgive me for living for something that is so small. Forgive me for living a small Christian life, a safe Christian life. Lord, I want to live that dangerous life you created me for. Jesus, I want to be like Jesus. I want to live that big dream that is worth giving everything for. If this is you, I'm going to ask you to just join those who are standing already. And I'm going to pray for you in a second. Come on, let's just appreciate those who are standing. We bless you, Lord. Thank you so much for the courage to do this. Father, I just want to thank you for my brothers and sisters who are standing. Some of them have been walking with you for a relatively short time. Others of them have walked with you for years. But Lord, in this holy moment, every one of them is your son and daughter and is hearing their father speaking. And Lord, there is a new thing that is happening in their heart. And you're beginning to speak a new word to them and lead them into a new season. And my father, I want to pray right now a dangerous prayer over them. I want to pray for them that, Lord, you would lead them into a season of holy discontent. Lord, I pray that they would no longer be content with the life that they've been living, no longer content with small, selfish dreaming, but that, Lord, they would begin to call out to you and wrestle with you like Jacob the whole night if necessary, whatever long, however long it takes, until you show them what you made them for. Lord, I thank you for my brothers and sisters who are here as well, who've been leading ministries, leading churches, and right now are feeling convicted. Lord, I've been calling people to a small dream, whereas you call me and raise me to call people to a kingdom dream. And I'm praying, Lord, have mercy on us, your servants. Give us the grace, Lord, that we will not raise ministries that are just catricatures, that are just a, 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 a copy of what is in the world around us. But God, give us the grace to start churches that are full of people who will change the world. Lord, help us to be like those early disciples who are small in number, not even educated. But when people met them, they knew these ones have been with Jesus. And I pray that, Lord, you would give us the grace that we would raise people in our churches. It's not about the numbers in our churches, but it's about the people in our churches. And I pray that, Lord, you would give us the heart to raise up armies in the different places you've put us in. Armies of people who would give everything for the sake of this call. And so, Father, I just want to worship you and thank you that you are here. And that, Lord, you hear my prayer. And I pray that, Lord, you would set every heart here ablaze. Every one of us, set us ablaze, Lord. And I pray that, Lord, as we charge out from this time, this time that has been so enriching and so fulfilling, that none of us would leave this place the same. No more selfish living or cheap giving, but that every one of us would live out of this place willing to lay down our lives for the call. And Lord, I pray for just a new spirit of revelation and wisdom. Oh, give, give us who are older, give us dreams. And give those who are younger visions according to your, your promise in Joel. And lead us into a season when we see the miracles of God in our generation. We love you, Jesus. And we honor you. And we pray all these things. Believing in that mighty and matchless name of our Lord and our Master, Jesus. And all God's people say, Amen. 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 Amen.